Chapters 1 through 5 of Theologia Germanica. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. A. Carter. Theologia Germanica by an anonymous author. Translated by Susanna Winkworth. Chapters 1 through 5. Chapter 1. Of that which is perfect, and that which is in part, and how that which is in part is done away, when that which is perfect is come. St. Paul saith, When that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now mark what is that which is perfect, and that which is in part. That which is perfect is a being who hath comprehended and included all things in himself, and his own substance, and without whom, and beside whom, there is no true substance, and in whom all things have their substance. For he is the substance of all things, and is in himself unchangeable and immovable, and changeth and moveth all things else. But that which is in part, or the imperfect, is that which hath its source in or springeth from the perfect, just as a brightness or a visible appearance floweth out from the sun or a candle, and appeareth to be somewhat this or that. And it is called a creature, and of all these things which are in part, none is perfect. So also the perfect is none of the things which are in part. The things which are in part can be apprehended, known, and expressed. But the perfect cannot be apprehended, known, or expressed, by any creature as creature. Therefore we do not give a name to the perfect, for it is none of these. The creature, as creature, cannot know nor apprehend it, name nor conceive it. Now when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. But when doth it come? I say, when as much as may be it is known, felt, tasted, of the soul. For the lack lieth altogether in us, and not in it. In like manner the sun lighteth the whole world, and is as near to one as another, yet a blind man seeth it not. But the fault thereof lieth in the blind man, not in the sun. And like as the sun may not hide its brightness, but must give light unto the earth, for heaven indeed draweth its light and heat from another fountain, so also God, who is the highest good, willeth not to hide himself from any, wheresoever he findeth a devout soul that is thoroughly purified from all creatures. For in what measure we put off the creature, in the same measure we are able to put on the Creator, neither more nor less. For if mine eye is to see anything, it must be single, or else be purified from all other things. And where heat and light enter in, cold and darkness must needs depart. It cannot be otherwise. But one might say, now since the perfect cannot be known nor apprehended of any creature, but the soul is a creature, how can it be known by the soul? Answer, this is why we say by the soul as a creature. We mean it is impossible to the creature in virtue of its creature nature and qualities, that by which it saith I and myself. For in whatsoever creature the perfect shall be known, therein creature, nature, qualities, the I, the self, and the like, must all be lost and done away. This is the meaning of that saying of St. Paul. When that which is perfect is come, that is, when it is known, then that which is in part, to wit, creature, nature, qualities, the I, the self, the mine, will be despised and counted for naught. So long as we think much of these things, cleave to them with love, joy, pleasure, or desire, so long remaineth the perfect unknown to us. But it might further be said, Thou sayest beside the perfect there is no substance, yet sayest again that somewhat floweth out from it. Now is not that which hath flowed out from it something beside it? Answer. This is why we say beside it or without it there is no true substance. That which hath flowed forth from it is no true substance, 
and hath no substance except in the perfect, but is an accident or a brightness or a visible appearance, which is no substance and hath no substance except in the fire whence the brightness flowed forth, such as the sun or a candle. Chapter 2 Of what sin is, and how we must not take unto ourselves any good thing, seeing that it belongeth unto the true good alone. The scripture and the faith and the truth say, Sin is naught else but that which the creature turneth away from the unchangeable good, and betaketh itself to the changeable. That is to say, that it turneth away from the perfect to that which is in part and imperfect, and most often to itself. Now mark, when the creature claimeth for its own anything good, such as substance, life, knowledge, power, and in short whatever we should call good, as it were that, or possessed that, or that were itself, or that proceeded from it, as often as this cometh to pass, the creature goeth astray. What did the devil do else, or what was his going astray and his fall else, but that he claimed for himself to be also somewhat, and would have it that somewhat was his, and somewhat was due to him? This setting up of a claim, and his I and me and mine, these were his going astray and his fall. And thus it is to this day. Chapter 3 how man's fall and going astray must be amended as Adam's fall was. What else did Adam do but this same thing? It is said it was because Adam ate the apple that he was lost or fell. I say it was because of his claiming something for his own, and because of his I, mine, me, and the like. Had he eaten seven apples, and yet never claimed anything for his own, he would not have fallen. But as soon as he called something his own, he fell, and would have fallen if he had never touched an apple. Behold, I have fallen a hundred times more often, and deeply, and gone a hundred times farther astray than Adam, and not all mankind could mend his fall or bring him back from going astray. But how shall my fall be amended? It must be healed, as Adam's fall was healed, and on the self-same wise, by whom and on what wise was that healing brought to pass? Mark this, man could not without God, and God should not without man. Wherefore God took human nature, or manhood, upon himself, and was made man, and man was made divine. Thus the healing was brought to pass, so also must my fall be healed. I cannot do the work without God, and God may not or will not without me. For if it shall be accomplished in me too, God must be made man, in such sort that God must take to himself all that is in me, within and without, so that there may be nothing in me which striveth against God or hindereth his work. Now if God took to himself all men that are in the world or ever were, and were made man in them, and they were made divine in him, and this work were not fulfilled in me, my fall and my wandering would never be amended except it were fulfilled in me also. And in this bringing back and healing, I can or may or shall do nothing of myself, but just simply yield to God, so that he alone may do all things in me and work, and I may suffer him and all his work and his divine will. And because I will not do so, but I count myself to be my own, and say, I, mine, me, and the like, God is hindered, so that he cannot do his work in me alone, and without hindrance, for this cause my fall, my going astray, remain unhealed. Behold, this all cometh of my claiming somewhat for my own. Chapter 4 How man, when he claimeth any good thing for his own, falleth and toucheth God in his honour. God saith, I will not give my glory to another. This is as much to say that praise and honor and glory belong to none but to God only. But now, if I call any good thing my own, as if I were it, or of myself had power, or did or knew anything, or as if anything were mine, or of me, or belonged to me, or were due to me, or the like, I take unto myself somewhat of honor and glory, 
and do two evil things. First, I fall and go astray, as aforesaid. Secondly, I touch God in his honor, and take unto myself what belongeth to God only. For all that must be called good belongeth to none but to the true eternal goodness, which is God only. And whoso taketh it unto himself committeth unrighteousness, and is against God. Chapter 5 how we are to take that saying that we must come to be without will, wisdom, love, desire, knowledge, and the like. Certain men say that we ought to be without will, wisdom, love, desire, knowledge, and the like. Hereby is not to be understood that there is to be no knowledge in man, and that God is not to be loved by him, nor desired and longed for, nor praised and honored. For that were a great loss, and man were like the beasts, and as the brutes that have no reason. But it meaneth that man's knowledge should be so clear and perfect that he should acknowledge of the truth that in himself he neither hath nor can do any good thing, and that none of his knowledge, wisdom, and art, his will, love, and good works do come from himself, nor are of man, nor of any creature, but that all these are of the eternal God, from whom they all proceed. As Christ himself saith, without me you can do nothing. St. Paul saith also, What hast thou that thou hast not received? As much as to say, Nothing. Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? Again he saith, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Now when a man duly perceiveth these things in himself, he and the creature fall behind, and he doth not call anything his own. And the less he taketh his knowledge unto himself, the more perfect doth it become. So also is it with the will, and love, and desire, and the like. For the less we call these things our own, the more perfect and noble and godlike do they become. And the more we think them our own, the baser and less pure and perfect do they become. Behold, on this sort must we cast all things from us, and strip ourselves of them. We must refrain from claiming anything for our own. When we do this, we shall have the best, fullest, clearest, and noblest knowledge that a man can have, and also the noblest and pure love, will, and desire. For then there will be all of God alone. It is much better that they should be gods than the creatures. Now that I ascribe anything good to myself, as if I were, or had done, or knew, or could perform any good thing, or that it were mine, this is all of sin and folly. For if the truth were rightly known by me, I should also know that I am not that good thing, and that it is not mine nor of me, and that I do not know it and cannot do it, and the like. If this came to pass, I should need cease to call anything my own. It is better that God or his works should be known as far as possible to us, and loved, praised, and honored, and the like, and even that man should vainly imagine he loveth or praiseth God, than that God should be altogether unpraised, unloved, unhonored, and unknown. For when the vain imagination and ignorance are turned to an understanding and knowledge of the truth, the claiming anything for our own will cease of itself. Then the man says, Behold, I, poor fool that I was, imagined it was I, but behold, it is and was of a truth, God. End of chapters 1 through 5 Recording by J. A. Carter www.afewparagraphs.com Chapters 6 through 10 of Theologia Germanica this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. A. Carter. Theologia Germanica by an anonymous author. Translated by Susanna Winkworth. Chapter 6 through 10. Chapter 6. How that which is best and noblest should also be loved above all things by us, merely because it is the best. A master called Botius saith, It is of sin that we do not love that which is best. 
he hath spoken the truth. That which is best should be the dearest of all things to us, and in our love of it neither helpfulness nor unhelpfulness, advantage nor injury, gain nor loss, honor nor dishonor, praise nor blame, nor anything of the kind should be regarded. But what is in truth the noblest and best of all things should also be the dearest of all things, and that for no other cause than that it is the noblest and best. Hereby may a man order his life within and without, his outward life, for among the creatures one is better than another, according as the eternal good manifesteth itself and worketh more in one than in another. Now that creature in which the eternal good most manifesteth itself, shineth forth, worketh, and is most known and loved, is the best, and that wherein the eternal good is least manifested is the least good of all creatures. Therefore, when we have to do with the creatures, and hold converse with them, and take note of their diverse qualities, the best creatures must always be the dearest to us, and we must cleave to them and unite ourselves to them, above all to those which we attribute to God as belonging to Him or divine, such as wisdom, truth, kindness, peace, love, justice, and the like. Hereby shall we order our outward man, and all that is contrary to these virtues we must eschew and flee from. But if our inward man were to make a leap and spring into the perfect, we should find and taste how that the perfect is without measure, number, or end, better and nobler than all which is imperfect and in part, and the eternal above the temporal or perishable, and the fountain and source above all that floweth or ever can flow from it. Thus that which is imperfect and in part would become tasteless and be as nothing to us. Be assured of this, all that we have said must come to pass if we are to love that which is noblest, highest, and best. Chapter 7 Of the eyes of the Spirit, wherewith man looketh into eternity and into time, and how the one is hindered of the other in its working. Let us remember how it is written and said that the soul of Christ had two eyes, a right and a left eye. In the beginning, when the soul of Christ was created, she fixed her right eye upon eternity and the Godhead, and remained in the full intuition and enjoyment of the divine essence and eternal perfection, and continued thus unmoved and undisturbed by all the accidents and travails, suffering, torment, and pain that ever befell the outward man. But with the left eye she beheld the creature, and perceived all things therein, and took note of the difference between the creatures, which were better or worse, nobler or meaner, and thereafter was the outward man of Christ ordered. Thus the inner man of Christ, according to the right eye of his soul, stood in the full exercise of his divine nature, in perfect blessedness, joy, and eternal peace. But the outward man and the left eye of Christ's soul stood with him in perfect suffering, in all tribulation, affliction, and travail, and this in such sort that the inward and right eye remained unmoved, unhindered, and untouched by all the travail, suffering, grief, and anguish that ever befell the outward man. It hath been said that when Christ was bound to the pillar and scourged, and when he hung upon the cross according to the outward man, yet his inner man, or soul, according to the right eye, stood in full possession of divine joy and blessedness as it did after his ascension, or as it doth now. In like manner his outward man, or soul, with the left eye, was never hindered, disturbed, or troubled by the inward eye in its contemplation of the outward things that belonged to it. Now the created soul of man hath also two eyes. The one is the power of seeing into eternity, the other of seeing into time and the creatures, of perceiving how they differ from each other as aforesaid, of giving life and needful things to the body, and ordering and governing it for the best. But these two eyes of the soul of man cannot both perform their work at once. But if the soul shall see with the right eye into eternity, then the left eye must close itself and refrain from working and be as though it were dead. For if the left eye be fulfilling its office toward outward things, that is, 
holding converse with time and the creatures, then must the right eye be hindered in its working, that is, in its contemplation. Therefore, whosoever will have the one must let the other go, for no man can serve two masters. Chapter 8 How the soul of man, while it is yet in the body, may obtain a foretaste of eternal blessedness. It hath been asked whether it be possible for the soul, while it is yet in the body, to reach so high as to cast a glance into eternity and receive a foretaste of eternal life and eternal blessedness. This is commonly denied, and truly so, in a sense. For it indeed cannot be so long as the soul is taking heed to the body and the things which minister and appertain thereto, and to time and the creature, and is disturbed and troubled and distracted thereby. For if the soul shall rise to such a state, she must be quite pure, wholly stripped and bare of all images, and entirely separate from all creatures, and above all, from herself. Now many think this is not to be done, and is impossible in this present time. But St. Dionysus maintains that it is possible, as we find from his words in his epistle to Timothy, where he saith, For the beholding of the hidden things of God, shalt thou forsake sense and the things of the flesh, and all that the senses can apprehend, and all that reason of her own powers can bring forth, and all things created and uncreated that reason is able to comprehend and know, and shalt take thy stand upon an utter abandonment of thyself, and as knowing none of the aforesaid things, and enter into union with him who is, and who is above all existence and all knowledge. Now if he did not hold this to be possible in this present time, why should he teach it and enjoin it on us in this present time? But it behoveth you to know that a master has said on this passage of St. Dionysus that it is possible, and may happen to a man often, till he becomes so accustomed to it as to be able to look into eternity whenever he will. For when a thing is at first very hard to a man, and strange, and seemingly quite impossible, if he put all his strength and energy into it, and persevere therein, that will afterward grow quite light and easy, which he at first thought quite out of reach, seeing that it is of no use to begin any work unless it may be brought to a good end. And a single one of these excellent glances is better, worthier, higher, and more pleasing to God than all that the creature can perform as a creature. And as soon as a man turneth himself in spirit, and with his whole heart and mind entereth into the mind of God, which is above time, all that ever he hath lost is restored in a moment. And if a man were to do thus a thousand times in a day, each time a fresh and real union would take place. And in this sweet and divine work standeth the truest and fullest union that may be in this present time. For he who hath attained thereto asketh nothing further, for he hath found the kingdom of heaven and eternal life on earth. Chapter 9 How it is better and more profitable for a man that he should perceive what God will do with him, or to what end he will make use of him, than if he knew all that God had ever wrought or would ever work through all the creatures, and how blessedness lieth alone in God, and not in the creatures or in any works. We should mark and know of a very truth that all manner of virtue and goodness, and even that eternal good which is God himself, can never make a man virtuous, good, or happy, so long as it is outside the soul, that is, so long as the man is holding converse with outward things through his senses and reason, and does not withdraw into himself, and learn to understand his own life, who and what he is. The like is true of sin and evil, for all manner of sin and wickedness can never make us evil, so long as it is outside of us, that is, so long as we do not commit it, or do not give consent to it. Therefore, although it be good and profitable that we should ask and learn and know what good and holy men have wrought and suffered, and how God hath dealt with them and what he hath wrought in and through them, yet it were a thousand times better that we should in ourselves learn and perceive and understand who we are, how and what our own life is, 
what God is and is doing in us, what he will have from us, and to what ends he will or will not make use of us. For of a truth, thoroughly to know oneself is above all art, for it is the highest art. If thou knowest thyself well, thou art better and more praiseworthy before God than if thou didst not know thyself, but didst understand the course of the heavens and all the planets and stars, also the dispositions of all mankind, also the nature of all beasts, and in such matters hadst all the skill of all who are in heaven and on earth. For it is said there came a voice from heaven, saying, Man, know thyself. Thus that proverb is still true, going out were never so good, but staying at home were much better. Further, ye should learn that eternal blessedness lieth in one thing alone, and in naught else. And if ever man or the soul is to be made blessed, that one thing alone must be in the soul. Now some might ask, but what is that one thing? I answer, it is goodness, or that which hath been made good, and yet neither this good or that, which we can name or perceive or show, but it is all and above all good things. Moreover, it needeth not to enter into this soul, for it is there already, only it is unperceived. When we say we should come unto it, we mean that we should seek it, feel it, and taste it. And now, since it is one, unity and singleness is better than manifoldness. For blessedness lieth not in much and many, but in one and oneness. In one word, blessedness lieth not in any creature or work of the creatures, but it lieth alone in God and in his works. Therefore I must wait only on God and his work, and leave on one side all creatures with their works, and first of all myself. In like manner all the great works and wonders that God has ever wrought or shall ever work in or through the creatures, or even God himself with all his goodness, so far as these things exist and are done outside of me, can never make me blessed, but only in so far as they exist and are done and loved, known, tasted, and felt within me. Chapter 10 How the perfect men have no other desire than that they may be to the eternal goodness what his hand is to a man, and how they have lost the fear of hell and hope of heaven. Now let us mark. Where men are enlightened with the true light, they perceive that all which they might desire or choose is nothing to that which all creatures, as creatures, ever desired or chose or knew. Therefore they renounce all desire and choice and commit and commend themselves and all things to the eternal goodness. Nevertheless, there remaineth in them a desire to go forward and get nearer to the eternal goodness, that is, to come to a clearer knowledge and warmer love and more comfortable assurance and perfect obedience and subjection, so that every enlightened man could say, I would fain be to the eternal goodness what his own hand is to a man. And he feareth always that he is not enough so, and longeth for the salvation of all men, and such men do not call this longing their own, nor take it unto themselves, for they know well that this desire is not of man, but of the eternal goodness. For whatsoever is good shall no one take unto himself as his own, seeing that it belongeth to the eternal goodness only. Moreover, these men are in a state of freedom, because they have lost the fear of pain or hell, and the hope of reward or heaven but are living in pure submission to the eternal goodness, in the perfect freedom of fervent love. This mind was in Christ in perfection, and is also in his followers, in some more and in some less, but it is a sorrow and shame to think that the eternal goodness is ever most graciously guiding and drawing us, and we will not yield to it. What is better and nobler than true poorness in spirit, Yet when that is held up before us, we will have none of it, but are always seeking ourselves and our own things. We like to have our mouths always filled with good things, that we may have in ourselves a lively taste of pleasure and sweetness. When this is so, we are well pleased, and think it standeth not amiss with us. But we are yet a long way off from a perfect life, for when God will draw us up to something higher, 
that is, to an utter loss and forsaking of our own things, spiritual and natural, and withdraweth his comfort and sweetness from us, we faint and are troubled and can in no wise bring our minds to it, and we forget God and neglect holy exercises and fancy that we are lost for ever. This is a great error and a bad sign, for a true lover of God loveth him or the eternal goodness alike in having and in not having, in sweetness and in bitterness, in good or evil report and the like, for he seeketh alone the honor of God, and not his own, either in spiritual or natural things. And therefore he standeth alike unshaken in all things, at all seasons. Hereby let every man prove himself how he standeth toward God, his Creator and Lord. End of chapter 6 through 10 Recording by J. A. Carter, www.afewparagraphs.com Chapters 11 through 15 of Theologia Germanica. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. A. Carter. Theologia Germanica by an anonymous author. Translated by Susanna Winkworth. Chapters 11 through 15. Chapter 11. How a righteous man in this present time is brought into hell, and there cannot be comforted, and how he is taken out of hell and carried into heaven, and there cannot be troubled. Christ's soul must needs descend into hell before it ascended into heaven. So must also the soul of man. But mark ye in what manner this cometh to pass. When a man truly perceiveth and considereth himself who and what he is, and findeth himself utterly vile and wicked and unworthy of all comfort and kindness that he hath ever received from God or from the creatures, he falleth into such a deep abasement and despising of himself that he thinketh himself unworthy that the earth should bear him, and it seemeth to him reasonable that all creatures in heaven and earth should rise up against him and avenge their creator on him, and should punish and torment him, and that he were unworthy even of that. And it seemeth to him that he shall be eternally lost and damned, and a footstool to all the devils in hell, and that this is right and just and all too little compared to his sins, which he so often and in so many ways hath committed against God, his creator. And therefore also he will not and dare not desire any consolation or release, either from God or from any creature that is in heaven or on earth. But he is willing to be unconsoled and unreleased, and he doth not grieve over his condemnation and sufferings, for they are right and just, and not contrary to God, but according to the will of God. Therefore they are right in his eyes, and he hath nothing to say against them, Nothing grieveth him but his own guilt and wickedness, for that is not right and is contrary to God, and for that cause he is grieved and troubled in spirit. This is what is meant by true repentance for sin, and he who in this present time entereth into this hell entereth afterward into the kingdom of heaven, and obtaineth a foretaste there of which excelleth all the delight and joy which he hath ever had or could have in this present time from temporal things. But whilst a man is thus in hell, none may console him, neither God nor the creature, as it is written, in hell there is no redemption. Of this state hath one said, Let me perish, let me die, I live without hope, from within and from without I am condemned, let no one pray that I may be released. Now God hath not forsaken a man in this hell, but he is laying his hand upon him, that the man may not desire nor regard anything but the eternal good only, and may come to know that that is so noble and passing good, that none can search out or express its bliss, consolation and joy, peace, rest and satisfaction. And then when the man neither careth for nor seeketh nor desireth anything but the eternal good alone, and seeketh not himself nor his own things, but the honor of God only, he is made a partaker of all manner of joy, bliss, peace, rest, and consolation, and so the man is henceforth in the kingdom of heaven. 
This hell and this heaven are two good, safe ways for a man in this present time, and happy is he who truly findeth them. For this hell shall pass away, but heaven shall endure for aye. Also let a man mark, when he is in this hell nothing may console him, and he cannot believe that he shall ever be released or comforted. But when he is in heaven, nothing can trouble him. He believeth also that none will ever be able to offend or trouble him. Albeit it is indeed true, that after this hell he may be comforted and released, and after this heaven he may be troubled and left without consolation. Again, this hell and this heaven come about a man in such sort that he knoweth not whence they come, and whether they come to him or depart from him, he can of himself do nothing toward it. Of these things he can neither give nor take away from himself, bring them nor banish them, but as it is written, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, that is to say, at this time present. But thou knowest not whence it cometh, nor whither it goeth. And when a man is in one of these two states, all is right with him, and he is as safe in hell as in heaven, and so long as a man is on earth, it is possible for him to pass oft times from the one into the other, nay, even within the space of a day and night, and all without his own doing. But when the man is in neither of these two states, he holdeth converse with the creature, and wavereth hither and thither, and knoweth not what manner of man he is. Therefore he shall never forget either of them, but lay up the remembrance of them in his heart. Chapter 12 Touching that true inward peace which Christ left to his disciples at the last. Many say, they have no peace nor rest, but so many crosses and trials, afflictions and sorrows, that they know not how they shall ever get through them. Now he who in truth will perceive and take note, perceiveth clearly, that true peace and rest lie not in outward things. For if it were so, the evil spirit also would have peace when things go according to his will, which is no wise the case. For the prophet declareth, There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. And therefore we must consider and see what is that peace which Christ left to his disciples at the last, when he said, My peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. We may perceive that in these words Christ did not mean a bodily or outward peace, for his beloved disciples, with all his friends and followers, have ever suffered from the beginning great affliction, persecution, nay, often martyrdom, as Christ himself said, In this world ye shall have tribulation. But Christ meant that true inward peace of the heart, which beginneth here and endureth for ever hereafter. Therefore he said, not as the world giveth, for the world is false, and deceiveth in her gifts. She promiseth much, and performeth little. Moreover there liveth no man on earth who may always have rest and peace without troubles and crosses, with whom things always go according to his will. There is always something to be suffered here, turn which way you will, and as soon as you are quit of one assault, perhaps two come in its place. Wherefore yield thyself willingly to them, and seek only that true peace of the heart, which none can take away from thee, that thou mayest overcome all assaults. Thus, then, Christ meant that inward peace which can break through all assaults and crosses of oppression, suffering, misery, humiliation, and what more there may be of the like, so that a man may be joyful and patient therein, like the beloved disciples and followers of Christ. Now he who will in love give his whole diligence and might thereto, will verily come to know that true eternal peace which is God himself, as far as it is possible to a creature, insomuch that what was bitter to him before shall become sweet, and his heart shall remain unmoved under all changes, at all times, and after this life he shall attain unto everlasting peace. Chapter 13 how a man may cast aside images too soon. Towler saith, There be some men at the present time who take leave of types and symbols too soon, before they have drawn out all the truth and instruction contained therein. Hence they are scarcely or perhaps never able to understand the truth aright, 
For such men will follow no one and lean unto their own understandings and desire to fly before they are fledged. They would fain mount up to heaven in one flight, albeit Christ did not so, for after his resurrection he remained full forty days with his beloved disciples. No one can be made perfect in a day. A man must begin by denying himself and willingly forsaking all things for God's sake, and must give up his own will and all his natural inclinations and separate and cleanse himself thoroughly from all sins and evil ways. After this, let him humbly take up the cross and follow Christ. Also let him take and receive example and instruction, reproof, counsel, and teaching from devout and perfect servants of God, and not follow his own guidance. Thus the work shall be established and come to a good end. And when a man hath thus broken loose from and outleaped all temporal things and creatures, he may afterwards become perfect in a life of contemplation. For he who will have the one must let the other go. There is no other way. Chapter 14 Of three stages by which a man is led upwards till he attaineth true perfection. Now be assured that no one can be enlightened unless he be first cleansed or purified and stripped. So also no one can be united with God unless he be first enlightened. Thus, there are three stages. First, the purification. Secondly, the enlightening. Thirdly, the union. The purification concerneth those who are beginning or repenting and is brought to pass in a threefold wise by contrition and sorrow for sin, by full confession, by hearty amendment. The enlightening belongeth to such as are growing, and also taketh place in three ways, to wit, by the eschewal of sin, by the practice of virtue and good works, and by the willing endurance of all manner of temptation and trials. The union belongeth to such as are perfect, and also is brought to pass in three ways to wit, by pureness and singleness of heart, by love, and by contemplation of God, the Creator of all things. Chapter 15 How all men are dead in Adam, and are made alive again in Christ, and of true obedience and disobedience. All that in Adam fell and died was raised again and made alive in Christ, and all that rose up and was made alive in Adam fell and died in Christ. But what was that? I answer, true obedience and disobedience. But what is true obedience? I answer, that a man should so stand free, being quit of himself, that is, of his I and me and self and mine and the like, that in all things he should no more seek or regard himself than if he did not exist and should take as little account of himself as if he were not, and another had done all his works. Likewise, he should count all the creatures for nothing. What is there, then, which is, and which we may count for somewhat? I answer nothing, but that which we may call God. Behold, this is very obedience in the truth, and thus it shall be in a blessed eternity. There nothing is sought, nor thought of, nor loved, but the one thing only." Hereby we may mark what disobedience is, to wit, that a man maketh some account of himself, and thinketh that he is, and knoweth, and can do somewhat, and seeketh himself and his own ends and the things around him, and hath regard to and loveth himself and the like. Man is created for true obedience, and is bound of right to render it to God. And this obedience fell and died in Adam, and rose again and lived in Christ, Yea, Christ's human nature was so utterly bereft of self, and apart from all creatures, as no man's ever was, and was nothing else but a house and habitation of God. Neither of that in him which belonged to God, nor of that which was a living human nature and a habitation of God, did he, as man, claim anything for his own. His human nature did not even take unto itself the Godhead, whose dwelling it was, nor anything that this same Godhead willed, or did, or left undone in him, nor yet anything of all that his human nature did or suffered. But in Christ's human nature there was no claiming of anything, 
nor seeking, nor desire, saving that what was due might be rendered to the Godhead, and he did not call this very desire his own. Of this matter no more can be said or written here, for it is unspeakable, and has never yet and never will be fully uttered, for it can neither be spoken nor written, but by him who is and knows its ground, that is, God himself, who can do all things well. End of chapters 11 through 15 Recording by J. A. Carter www.afewparagraphs.com Chapters 16 through 20 of Theologia Germanica This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Org. Recording by J. A. Carter. Theologia Germanica by an anonymous author. Translated by Susanna Winkworth. Chapter 16 through 20. Chapter 16. Telleth us what is the old man and what is the new man. Again, when we read of the old man and the new man, we must mark what that meaneth. The old man is Adam and disobedience, the self, the me, and so forth. But the new man is Christ and true obedience, a giving up and denying oneself of all temporal things and seeking the honor of God alone in all things. And when dying and perishing and the like are spoken of, it meaneth that the old man should be destroyed and not seek its own either in spiritual or in natural things. For where this is brought about in a true divine light, there the new man is born again. In like manner, it hath been said that man should die unto himself, that is, to earthly pleasures, consolations, joys, appetites, the eye, the self, and all that is thereof in man, to which he clingeth, and on which he is yet leaning with content, and thinketh much of. Whether it be the man himself, or any other creature, whatever it be, it must depart and die if the man is to be brought aright to another mind, according to the truth. Thereunto doth St. Paul exhort us, saying, Put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now he who liveth to himself after the old man is called, and truly is, a child of Adam. And though he may give diligence to the ordering of his life, he is still the child and brother of the evil spirit. But he who liveth in humble obedience, and in the new man, which is Christ, he is in like manner the brother of Christ, and the child of God. Behold, where the old man dieth, and the new man is born, there is that second birth, of which Christ saith, except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Likewise St. Paul saith, As in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. That is to say, all who follow Adam in pride, in lust of the flesh, and in disobedience, are dead in soul, and never will or can be made alive but in Christ. And for this cause, so long as a man is an Adam or his child, he is without God. Christ saith, He who is not with me is against me. Now he who is against God is dead before God. Whence it followeth that all Adam's children are dead before God. But he who standeth with Christ in perfect obedience, he is with God and liveth. As it hath been said already, Sin lieth in the turning away of the creature from the Creator, which agreeeth with what we have now said. For he who is in disobedience is in sin, and sin can never be atoned for or healed but by returning to God, and this is brought to pass by humble obedience. For so long as a man continueth in disobedience, his sin can never be blotted out. Let him do what he will, it availeth him nothing. Let us be assured of this. For disobedience is itself sin, but when a man entereth into the obedience of the faith, all is healed and blotted out and forgiven and not else. 
insomuch that if the evil spirit himself could come into true obedience, he would become an angel again, and all his sin and wickedness would be healed and blotted out and forgiven at once. And could an angel fall into disobedience, he would straightway become an evil spirit, although he did nothing afresh. If then it were possible for a man to renounce himself and all things, and to live as holy and purely in true obedience as Christ did in his human nature, such a man were quite without sin, and were one thing with Christ, and the same by grace which Christ was by nature. But it is said, this cannot be. So also it is said, there is none without sin. But be that as it may, this much is certain, that the nearer we are to perfect obedience, the less we sin, and the farther from it we are, the more we sin. In brief, whether a man be good, better, or best of all, bad, worse, or worst of all, sinful or saved before God, it all lieth in this matter of obedience. Therefore it hath been said, the more of self and me, the more of sin and wickedness. So likewise it hath been said, the more the self, the I, the me, the mine, that is, self-seeking and selfishness, abate in a man, the more doth God's I, that is, God himself, increase in him. Now, if all mankind abode in true obedience, there would be no grief nor sorrow. For if it were so, all men would be at one, and none would vex or harm another. So also none would lead a life or do any deed contrary to God's will. Whence then should grief or sorrow arise? But now, alas, all men, nay, the whole world, lieth in disobedience. Now were a man simply and wholly obedient as Christ was, all disobedience were in him a sharp and bitter pain. But though all men were against him, they could neither shake nor trouble him. For while in this obedience a man were one with God, and God himself were one with the man. Behold now, all disobedience is contrary to God and nothing else. In truth, no thing is contrary to God. No creature nor creature's work nor anything that we can name or think of is contrary to God or displeasing to him, but only disobedience and the disobedient man. In short, all that is is well-pleasing and good in God's eyes, saving only the disobedient man. But he is so displeasing and hateful to God, and grieveth him so sore, that if it were possible for human nature to die a hundred deaths, God would willingly suffer them all for one disobedient man, that he might slay disobedience in him, and that obedience might be born again. Behold, albeit no man may be so single and perfect in his obedience as Christ was, Yet it is possible to every man to approach so near thereunto as to be rightly called godlike and a partaker of the divine nature. And the nearer a man cometh thereunto, and the more godlike and divine he becometh, the more he hateth all disobedience, sin, evil, and unrighteousness, and the worse they grieve him. Disobedience and sin are the same thing, for there is no sin but disobedience and what is done of disobedience is all sin. Therefore all we have to do is to keep ourselves from disobedience. Chapter 17 How we are not to take unto ourselves what we have done well, but only what we have done amiss. Behold, now it is reported, there be some who vainly think and say that they are so wholly dead to self and quit of it, as to have reached and abide in a state where they suffer nothing and are moved by nothing, just as if all men were living in obedience or as if there were no creatures. And thus they profess to continue always in an even temper of mind, so that nothing cometh amiss to them, howsoever things fall out, well or ill. Nay, verily, the matter standeth not so, but as we have said. It might be thus, if all men were brought into obedience, but until then it cannot be. But it may be asked, Are not we to be separate from all things, and neither to take unto ourselves evil nor good? I answer, No one shall take goodness unto himself, for that belongeth to God, and his goodness only. 
but thanks be unto the man and everlasting reward and blessings who is fit and ready to be a dwelling and tabernacle of the eternal goodness and godhead wherein god may exert his power and will and work without hindrance but if any now will excuse himself for sin by refusing to take what is evil unto himself and laying the guilt thereof upon the evil spirit and thus make himself out to be quite pure and innocent as our first parents Adam and Eve did while they were yet in paradise, when each laid the guilt upon the other. He hath no right at all to do this, for it is written, There is none without sin. Therefore I say, Reproach, shame, loss, woe, and eternal damnation be to the man who is fit and ready and willing that the evil spirit and falsehood lies and all untruth wickedness and other evil things should have their will and pleasure word and work in him and make him their house and habitation chapter eighteen how that the life of christ is the noblest and best life that ever hath been or can be and how a careless life of false freedom is the worst life that can be of a truth we ought to know and believe that there is no life so noble and good and well-pleasing to god as the life of christ and yet it is to nature and selfishness the bitterest life a life of carelessness and freedom is to nature and the self and the me the sweetest and pleasantest life but it is not the best and in some men may become the worst but though christ's life be the most bitter of all yet it is to be preferred above all Hereby shall ye mark this, there is an inward sight which hath power to perceive the one true good, and that it is neither this nor that, but that of which St. Paul saith, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. By this he meaneth that the whole and perfect excelleth all the fragments, and that all which is in part and imperfect is as naught compared to the perfect. Thus, likewise, all knowledge of the parts is swallowed up when the whole is known, and where the good is known, it cannot but be longed for and loved so greatly that all other love wherewith the man hath loved himself and other things fadeth away. And that inward sight likewise perceiveth what is best and noblest in all things, and loveth it in the one true good, and only for the sake of that true good. Behold, where there is this inward sight, the man perceiveth of a truth that Christ's life is the best and noblest life, and therefore the most to be preferred, and he willingly accepteth and endureth it, without a question or a complaint, whether it please or offend nature or other men, whether he like or dislike it, findeth sweet or bitter, and the like. And therefore, whenever this perfect and true good is known, there also the life of Christ must be led until the death of the body. And he who vainly thinketh otherwise is deceived, and he who saith otherwise lieth. And in what man the life of Christ is not of him the true good and eternal truth will nevermore be known. Chapter 19 How we cannot come to the true light and Christ's life by much questioning or reading or by high natural skill and reason but by truly renouncing ourselves and all things. Let no one suppose that we may attain to this true light and perfect knowledge or life of Christ by much questioning, or by hearsay, or by reading and study, nor yet by high skill and great learning. Yea, so long as a man taketh account of anything which is this or that, whether it be himself or any other creature, or doeth anything, or frameth a purpose for the sake of his own likings, or desires, or opinions, or ends, he cometh not unto the life of Christ. This hath Christ himself declared, for he saith, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. He that taketh not his cross, and followeth after me, is not worthy of me. And if he hate not his father, and mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, Yea, and his own life also he cannot be my disciple. He meaneth it thus, He who doth not forsake and part with everything can never know my eternal truth, nor attain unto my life. And though this had never been declared to us, yet the truth herself saith it, for it is so of a truth. 
But so long as a man clingeth unto the elements and fragments of this world, and above all to himself, and holdeth converse with them, and maketh great account of them, he is deceived and blinded, and perceiveth what is good no further than as it is most convenient and pleasant to himself, and profitable to his own ends. These he holdeth to be the highest good, and loveth above all. Thus he never cometh to the truth. Chapter 20 How, seeing that the life of Christ is most bitter to nature and self, nature will have none of it, and chooseth a false, careless life as is most convenient to her. Now since the life of Christ is every way most bitter to nature and the self and the me, for in the true life of Christ the self and the me and nature must be forsaken and lost, and die altogether, therefore in each of us nature hath a horror of it, and thinketh it evil and unjust and a folly, and graspeth after such a life as shall be most comfortable and pleasant to herself, and saith and believeth also in her blindness that such a life is the best possible. Now nothing is so comfortable and pleasant to nature as a free, careless way of life. Therefore she clingeth to that, and taketh enjoyment in herself and her own powers, and looketh only to her own peace and comfort and the like. And this happeneth most of all, where there are high natural gifts of reason, for that soareth upward in its own light and by its own power, till at last it cometh to think itself the true eternal light, and giveth itself out as such, and is thus deceived in itself, and deceiveth other people along with it, who know no better, and also are thereunto inclined. End of chapter 16 through 20 Recording by J. A. Carter, www.afewparagraphs.com Chapters 26 through 30 of Theologia Germanica. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. A. Carter. Theologia Germanica by an anonymous author. Translated by Susanna Winkworth. Chapters 26 through 30. Chapter 26. Touching poorness of spirit and true humility, and whereby we may discern the true and lawful free men whom the truth hath made free. But it is quite otherwise where there is poorness of spirit and true humility, and it is so because it is found and known of a truth that a man of himself and his own power is nothing, hath nothing, can do and is capable of nothing but only infirmity and evil. Hence followeth that the man findeth himself altogether unworthy of all that hath been or ever will be done for him by God or the creatures, and that he is a debtor to God and also to all the creatures in God's stead, both to bear with and to labor for and to serve them. And therefore he doth not in any wise stand up for his own rights, but from the humility of his heart he saith, It is just and reasonable, that God and all creatures should be against me, and have a right over me and to me, and that I should not be against any one, nor have a right to anything. Hence it followeth that the man doth not and will not crave or beg for anything, either from God or the creatures, beyond mere needful things, and for those only with shamefacedness, as a favor and not as a right. And he will not minister unto or gratify his body or any of his natural desires beyond what is needful, nor allow that any should help or serve him except in case of necessity, and then always with trembling. For he hath no right to anything, and therefore he thinketh himself unworthy of anything. So likewise all his own discourse, ways, words, and works seem to this man a thing of naught and a folly. Therefore he speaketh little, and doth not take upon himself to admonish or rebuke any, unless he be constrained thereto by love or faithfulness towards God, and even then he doth it in fear, and so little as may be. Moreover, when a man hath this poor and humble spirit, he cometh to see and understand aright how that all men are bent upon themselves and inclined to evil and sin, 
and that on this account it is needful and profitable that there be order, customs, laws, and precepts, to the end that the blindness and foolishness of men may be corrected, and that vice and wickedness may be kept under, and constrained to seemliness. For without ordinances men would be much more mischievous and ungovernable than dogs and cattle, and few have come to the knowledge of the truth, but what have begun with holy practices and ordinances, and exercised themselves therein so long as they knew nothing more nor better. Therefore one who is poor in spirit and of a humble mind doth not despise or make light of law, order, precepts, and holy customs, nor yet of those who observe and cleave wholly to them, but with loving pity and gentle sorrow crieth, Almighty Father, thou eternal truth, I make my lament unto thee, and it grieveth thy spirit too, that through man's blindness, infirmity, and sin, that is made needful and must be, which in deed and truth were neither needful nor right, for those who are perfect are under no law. So order, laws, precepts, and the like are merely an admonition to men who understand nothing better, and know and perceive not wherefore all law and order is ordained. And the perfect, except the law, along with such ignorant men as understand and know nothing better, and practice it with them, to the intent that they may be restrained thereby and kept from evil ways, or, if it be possible, brought to something higher. Behold, all that we have said of poverty and humility is so of a truth, and we have the proof and witness thereof in the pure life of Christ and in his words. For he both practiced and fulfilled every work of true humility and all other virtues, as shineth forth in his holy life, and he saith also expressly, Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Moreover, he did not despise and set at naught the law and the commandments, nor yet the men who are under the law. He saith, I am not come to destroy the law or the prophets, but to fulfill. But he saith further, that to keep them is not enough. We must press forward to what is higher and better, as is indeed true. He saith, Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. For the law forbiddeth evil works, but Christ condemneth also evil thoughts. The law alloweth us to take vengeance on our enemies, but Christ commandeth us to love them. The law forbiddeth not the good things of this world, but he counseleth us to despise them. And he hath set his seal upon all he said with his own holy life, for he taught nothing that he did not fulfill in work, and he kept the law and was subject unto it to the end of his mortal life. Likewise St. Paul saith, Christ was made under the law to redeem them that were under the law. That is, that he might bring them to something higher and nearer to himself. He said again, The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. In a word, in Christ's life and words and works, we find nothing but true, pure humility and poverty, such as we have set forth. And therefore, where God dwelleth in a man, and the man is a true follower of Christ, it will be, and must be, and ought to be the same. But where there is pride, and a haughty spirit, and a light, careless mind, Christ is not, nor any true follower of his. Christ said, My soul is troubled even unto death. He meaneth his bodily death, that is to say, from the time that he was born of Mary until his death on the cross, he had not one joyful day, but only trouble, sorrow, and contradiction. Therefore it is just and reasonable that his servants should be even as their master. Christ saith also, Blessed are the poor in spirit, that is, those who are truly humble, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And thus we find it of a truth where God is made man, for in Christ and in all his true followers there must needs be thorough humility and poorness of spirit, a lowly retiring disposition, and a heart laden with a secret sorrow and mourning so long as this mortal life lasteth. And he who dreameth otherwise is deceived, and deceiveth others with him as aforesaid. Therefore nature and self always avoid this life and cling to a life of false freedom and ease, as we have said. Behold, now cometh an Adam, or an evil spirit, wishing to justify himself, and make excuse, and saith, 
Thou wilt almost have it that Christ was bereft of self and the like, yet he spoke often of himself and glorified himself in this and that. Answer, when a man in whom the truth worketh hath and ought to have a will toward anything, his will and endeavor and works are for no end but that the truth may be seen and manifested. And this will was in Christ, and to this end words and works were needful, and what Christ did because it was the most profitable and best means thereunto, he no more took unto himself than anything else that happened. Dost thou say now, then there was a wherefore in Christ? I answer, if thou wert to ask the sun, why shinest thou? He would say, I must shine, and cannot do otherwise, for it is my nature and property. But this my property and the light I give is not of myself, and I do not call it mine. So likewise it is with God and Christ and all who are godly and belong unto God. In them is no willing nor working nor desiring, but has for its end goodness as goodness, for the sake of goodness, and they have no other wherefore than this. Chapter 27 How we are to take Christ's words when he bade forsake all things, and wherein the union with the divine will standeth. Now, according to what hath been said, ye must observe that when we say, as Christ also saith, that we ought to resign and forsake all things, this is not to be taken in the sense that a man is neither to do nor to purpose anything. For a man must always have something to do and to order so long as he liveth. But we are to understand by it that the union with God standeth not in any man's powers, in his working or abstaining, perceiving or knowing, nor in that of all the creatures taken together. Now what is this union? It is that we should be, of a truth, purely, simply, and wholly, at one with the one eternal will of God, or altogether without will, so that the created will should flow out into the eternal will, and be swallowed up and lost therein, so that the eternal will alone should do and leave undone in us. Now mark what may help or further us towards this end. Behold, neither exercises, nor words, nor works, nor any creature, nor creature's work can do this. In this wise, therefore, must we renounce and forsake all things, that we must not imagine or suppose that any words, works, or exercises, any skill or cunning, or any created thing, can help or serve us thereto. Therefore, we must suffer these things to be what they are, and enter into the union with God. Yet outward things must be, and we must do and refrain so far as is necessary. Especially we must sleep and wake, walk and stand still, speak and be silent, and much more of the like. These must go on so long as we live. Chapter 28 How, after a union with the divine will, the inward man standeth immovable, the while the outward man is moved hither and thither. Now, when this union truly cometh to pass, and becometh established, the inward man standeth henceforward immovable in this union, and God suffereth the outward man to be moved hither and thither, from this to that, of such things as are necessary and right. So that the outward man saith in sincerity, I have no will to be or not to be, to live or die, to know or not to know, to do or to leave undone, and the like, but I am ready for all that is to be or ought to be, and obedient thereunto, whether I have to do or to suffer. And thus the outward man hath no wherefore or purpose, but only to do his part to further the eternal will. For it is perceived of a truth that the inward man shall stand immovable, and that it is needful for the outward man to be moved. And if the inward man have any wherefore in the actions of the outward man, he saith only that such things must be and ought to be as are ordained by the eternal will. And where God himself dwelleth in the man, it is thus, as we plainly see in Christ. Moreover, where there is this union, which is the offspring of a divine light and dwelleth in its beams, there is no spiritual pride or irreverent spirit, but boundless humility and a lowly broken heart, also an honest, blameless walk, justice, peace, content, and all that is of virtue must needs be there. Where they are not, 
there is no right union, as we have said, for just as neither this thing nor that can bring about or further this union, so there is nothing which hath power to frustrate or hinder it, save the man himself, with his self-will that doeth him this great wrong. Of this be well assured. Chapter 29 How a man may not attain so high before death as not to be moved or touched by outward things. There be some who affirm that a man, while in this present time, may and ought to be above being touched by outward things, and in all respects as Christ was after his resurrection. This they try to prove and establish by Christ's words, I go before you into Galilee, there ye shall see me. And again, a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. These sayings they interpret thus, as ye have seen me and been followers of me in my mortal body and life, so also it behoveth you to see me and follow me as I go before you into Galilee, that is to say, into a state in which nothing hath power to move or grieve the soul, on which state ye shall enter and live and continue therein before that ye have suffered and gone through your bodily death. And as ye see me having flesh and bones and not liable to suffer, so shall ye likewise, while yet in the body, and having your mortal nature, cease to feel outward things, were it even the death of the body. Now I answer in the first place to this affirmation, that Christ did not mean that a man should or could attain unto this state unless he have first gone through and suffered all that Christ did. Now Christ did not attain thereunto before he had passed through and suffered his natural death, and what things appertain thereunto. Therefore no man can or ought to come to it so long as he is mortal and liable to suffer. For if such a state were the noblest and best, and if it were possible and right to attain to it, as aforesaid, in this present time, then it would have been attained by Christ. For the life of Christ is the best and noblest, the worthiest and loveliest in God's sight that ever was or will be. Therefore, if it was not and could not be so with Christ, it will never be so with any man. Therefore, though some may imagine and say that such a life is the best and noblest life, yet it is not so. Chapter 30 On what wise we may came to be beyond and above all custom, order, law, precepts, and the like. Some say further, that we can and ought to get beyond all virtue, all custom and order, all law, precepts, and seemliness, so that all these should be laid aside, thrown off, and set at naught. Herein there is some truth, and some falsehood. Behold and mark, Christ was greater than his own life, and above all virtue, custom, ordinances, and the like, and so also is the evil spirit above them but with a difference. For Christ was and is above them on this wise, that his words and works and ways, his doings and refrainings, his speech and silence, his sufferings and whatsoever happened to him, were not forced upon him, neither did he need them, neither were they of any profit to himself. It was and is the same, with all manner of virtue, order, laws, decency, and the like, for all that may be reached by them is already in Christ to perfection. In this sense, that saying of St. Paul is true and receiveth its fulfillment. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God, and are not under the law, but under grace. That meaneth, man need not teach them what they are to do or abstain from, for their master, that is, the Spirit of God, shall verily teach them what is needful for them to know. Likewise, they do not need that men should give them precepts or command them to do right and not to do wrong and the like. For the same admirable master who teaches them what is good or not good, what is higher and lower, and in short leadeth them into all truth, he reigneth also within them, and biddeth them to hold fast that which is good and to let the rest go, and to him they give ear. Behold, in this sense, they need not to wait upon any law, either to teach or to command them. In another sense also they need no law, namely, in order to seek or win something thereby, or get any advantage for themselves. 
for whatever help toward eternal life or furtherance in the way everlasting they might obtain from the aid or counsel or words or works of any creature they possess already beforehand behold in this sense also it is true that we may rise above all law and virtue and also above the works and knowledge and powers of any creature end of chapters 26 through 30 recording by j a carter www.afewparagraphs.com